In this opening chapter of Victor's narrative, we learn about his upbringing and other characters in his life. He is from Switzerland, from a good family, with loving parents and two younger brothers. They even adopt Victor's cousin as their own after his father's sister passes away. Young Elizabeth will be a key figure in the novel as we continue. And he has a friend throughout his childhood, Henry, who is like part of the family and will visit him often throughout the story. Victor describes his parents as being indulgent. Nothing was ever forced on him as he had a sort of relaxed education, one where he was free to explore his own interests. This style of parenting and education became popular during the Romantic era and continues today in Montessori-style schools, where there is less formal instruction and discipline. Jean-Jacques Rousseau's book, Emile, though it was a novel, was kind of an instruction book on raising children who'd be good members of society, was very influential on authors and intellectuals of Shelley's time. There is certainly value in this type of education as children do need room to play and explore and discover, but it carries with it an assumption, which will be explored more deeply a bit later, that human beings are inherently good, that they'll find their own way, and that it is too much institutional influence and restriction that makes people turn immoral. But Victor also says in his household, care and pain seemed forever banished. My father directed our studies and my mother partook of our enjoyments. Neither of us possessed the slightest preeminence over the other. The voice of command was never heard amongst us, but mutual affection engaged us all to comply with and obey the slightest desire of each other. In other words, this is a very egalitarian rather than hierarchical household. This sounds positive, but as good a man as Victor's father is, we can see Victor is not receiving much leadership, much guidance during his teenage years. Social equality might be a valuable goal, but as we just said, this ignores some natural fallibility of humans. People mess up and harm each other, even in families. When things aren't running smoothly, how do people find correction if there's no structure? Victor becomes excited by science as he gets older and describes coming upon an old book in a library that looks scientific but is largely about magic and the occult. When he goes to show his father, he's told that it's trash and to stop wasting his time. And Victor, as he's reflecting back, says something important here. He wishes his father would have told him why the book was not appropriate. Its theories were debunked and outdated. Instead of just saying no, perhaps he would have listened to them but he kept reading the book. This is good advice, I think, for parents. Just saying no and because I said so isn't very effective. Having honest conversations about the nature of things and why some things are harmful is a much better tactic if you want your children to listen to you. Obviously, if children are so little they don't understand you, that may not be possible, but once they're old enough to listen and begin reasoning, explaining the why of life is really important. Victor says that because he was not from a scientific family and wasn't forced to attend formal schooling, he missed out on important lectures by real scholars, and he says, my dreams were therefore undisturbed by reality. So Victor hasn't had anyone in his life to show him the boundaries. So he develops these ideas of grandeur and hopes for glory, for possibly discovering a way to banish disease and render man invulnerable. He wants to defeat nature itself. And we can understand this goal, after all, that's why we have doctors and invent vaccines and medicines and other life-saving and life-improving devices. But there are always costs and the possibility of going too far, and even harming people we intend to help. And if Victor doesn't have much experience with limits, we have to wonder if he might let his imagination get the better of him. The next couple of sections show Victor's educational development. He's off at college now in Germany, and he's learning the ropes of what real scientists do. He listens to lectures and meets various professors and finds a mentor at Mr. Waldman, who advises Victor to make sure he's well-rounded, studying all the areas of science and math, not just one. And he hears about two differing views of the history of science. Mr. Kemp, a teacher Victor doesn't really like, tells Victor that the old scientists, the ones Victor had been reading about in his youth, had long been proven wrong, and that it's foolish to consider them useful at all. On the other hand, Mr. Waldman says, despite those men being wrong in their studies, they are the foundation of where we are today. Even when people are wrong, they can be useful to future generations of study. This is an important point, not just for science, but for all human knowledge. It's very easy to call people from the past backward or stupid or tyrannical or immoral. And maybe in some ways they were, especially according to a modern standard. But for most of human history, people had to simply try things out to experiment in ways we may now think are ridiculous, but at the time it was the best option. But maybe people doing things the wrong way for a while is what spurred us to discover a better way. Think about this. Meth and heroin 
used to be considered medicine. Even tobacco was thought of by some as a treatment for, get this, asthma. From bloodletting to lobotomies, there were all sorts of things that were thought to be good at the time that only now we realize were quite terrible. And the same is true in social beliefs. Slavery and segregation, testing women's swimming ability to see if they were witches, to not allowing women or different races the opportunity to vote. These are all seen today as backward and oppressive, but the harms of the past also became great achievements of changing our country for the better. This is certainly not an endorsement of those old practices that we needed them to get to where we are now, but rather that people do things scientifically or socially for reasons that may have seemed rational at the time they were done. And it's only through continued exploration and practice and knowledge that we can make such improvements. This is why we must be allowed to continue examining our beliefs and theories and methods of today, yesterday, a hundred years ago. We have to be able to talk openly about them so that we can keep learning. If we ignore the past and forget where we came from, it's much easier to be fooled that we're doing the right things in the present. It's easier to learn from mistakes that have already occurred than to repeat them again and again.